Okay, students, we're going to begin the second part of this chapter on a chemical bond. And, and in this video lesson, we're going to talk about Lewis dot structures of molecules. But before we go into the rules on how you draw Lewis dot structures, let's talk about the electronegativity scale and Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was a famous American chemist and biochemist and a peace activist. He is the only person to have won two unshared Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry and one in peace. He wrote uh, a famous book called The Nature of the Chemical Bond, which described valence bond theory, which we're going to cover later. And another one of his contributions was the development of the electronegativity scale. Now, in other lectures, we talked about ionization energy or ionization potential, and we've talked about electron affinity as experimental ways for describing essentially the affinity of electrons for an atom or how difficult it is to tear away an electron from an atom to form a cation. Uh, the electronegativity scale essentially combines these theories, but instead of having uh, these numbers of so many kilojoules per mole for an ionization energy, he reduced this to a, a very simple scale of essentially 0 to 4 or 0 0.8, 0 0.7 or so to 4. And that scale is shown in the next representation of the periodic table where the element that is highest on this electronegativity scale is fluorine with a value of 4 over to the right. And then at the bottom left, the element with the lowest value, 0.7 for francium. And essentially, the electronegativity value increases from the bottom left to the upper right. And if you notice the upper right part of the periodic table, which has many of the elements that we deal with most often in drawing Lewis dot structures and molecules, that the value of electronegativity drops in half steps as you go from the rightmost part of the electronegativity scale to, to the left. Uh, fluorine is 4. Oxygen would be three and a half, half unit step downwards. Nitrogen three, carbon two and a half, boron two, and then even over to beryllium of one and a half and lithium of one. So the scale has some simplifying features. And as you go down the periodic table, the electronegativities tend to increase, although there are some places where there are exceptions in the transition metal valley, but we don't deal with those as often in drawing loose, loose dot structures. So fluorine is the most electronegative element on this scale. The second most is oxygen. And then third, it's sort of a tie between chlorine and nitrogen. And then the next would be carbon and sulfur. And then the next would be bromine. And following that, we have a three-way tie between carbon and sulfur and iodine, a three-way tie. And then on and on. So basically, what you need to know is that fluorine is the most electronegative with four, then next is oxygen, then next is sort of this tie between nitrogen and, and chlorine. And that hydrogen has a lower electronegativity of 2.1, which is somewhat similar to that of carbon. The carbon is a little bit more electronegative, but not much as compared to hydrogen. You will need to be able to recall at least relative positions on the electronegativity scale so that when we consider a molecule that contains carbon and fluorine and oxygen and nitrogen, that you will know which is the most electronegative and which is the least electronegative. Just remember, fluorine always wins, then next is oxygen, and that'll get you uh, pretty far. So this is, this is an important slide. This tells you the rules for drawing Lewis dot structures. The rules are the following. You just have to go through them. First, place the atom with the lowest electronegativity value in the center and place other atoms, which we'll call terminal, terminal atoms, in the four positions, top, bottom, left, right, around a central atom. In some cases, we will have to draw two central atoms, and that may be confusing now, but we'll see in a second what that means. But an important part of this rule is that hydrogen, even though it's, it has a very low electronegativity, hydrogen is too small, can never be the central atom. The central atom quite often is carbon, as we will see. Rule number two, count the total number of valence electrons. I usually call this V sub T, total valence. Rule number three, distribute these valence electrons two at a time, forming sigma bonds between the central atom and each of the terminal atoms, and as you count down the value of VT to zero. If, rule number four, if there are additional electrons, place them as electron pairs around the terminal atoms except that you can't place these additional leftover electrons around a terminal hydrogen, because again, hydrogen is too small, it doesn't have a place for these extra electrons. And there can be up to three of these pairs of extra electrons, what we 
we'll call non-bonded pairs around the terminal atoms. Next rule, if there are still electrons left over that you haven't placed somewhere, you have to place them around the central atom, even if that means things get really crowded. The next rule is you check for the octet rule. Remember the octet rule, the rule of eight electrons? We always like to have eight electrons around the atoms that we can see, except hydrogen, which can only have two electrons. In doing this check for the octet rule, we will count each bonded pair, each which we will then usually represent as a dash, each bonded pair as two around the central atom, even though in essence it's shared with the what it's bonded to, plus we count each of the non-bonded pairs. We'll see examples of what we mean shortly. And if the central atom does not have eight electrons, if the octet rule is not satisfied for that central atom, then we have to do something funky. We have to bring down or recruit a non-bonded pair from one of the terminal atoms to form a second bond, what we call a pi bond. And we do this more than once if necessary to satisfy the octet rule for the central atom. Now these rules for drawing Lewis dot structures may seem overwhelming at, at first, but let's just do some and as you'll see that not so bad and, and in many cases we can draw the Lewis dot structure of a molecule only using some of the first few rules along the way. So let's try these. CH4, methane, H2O, water of course, NH3 ammonia, NH4 plus ammonium, CH2O, which is called formaldehyde, CO2, carbon dioxide, SO2, sulfur dioxide, the polyatomic oxyanions carbonate and sulfate, and then boron trifluoride and phosphorus pentafluoride. If we can do all of these, I think we will have mastered the, the rules that we just listed. Let's begin with methane, CH4. Now, between carbon and hydrogen, the atom that will go in the center is carbon because because, as we said, hydrogens can never go in the middle. They're too small. Um, so we already know we're going to put carbon in the middle and then dress the hydrogens top, bottom, left, right, around the four positions. One of the first things I always do is add up the total number of valence electrons. In this case, there are four, four carbon, and then four times one, because there's one for each hydrogen, four times one. So four plus four times one is eight. That would be the total number of valence electrons. So I place the carbon in the center. I add the four hydrogens as terminal atoms in the four positions, top, bottom, left, right. Then I begin counting down from eight, two at a time, forming sigma bonds between the central carbon and each of the terminal atoms. So I do that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I have formed the Lewis dot structure of methane. It's simple as that. That's as far as I needed to go down that list of rules because I've satisfactorily drawn the molecule. Let's go to the second uh, one we're going to try, and that's water, H2O. Again, between oxygens and hydrogens, the atom that will go in the middle is oxygen, and that's because hydrogens can never go in the middle. Okay, now adding up VT, 6 for oxygen, 2 times 1 for 8, the total number of valence electrons is 8. Okay, so we plus, place oxygen in the middle and count down from 8. When we do this, we will place 1, 2, 3, 4 to form sigma bonds between the oxygen and the two terminal hydrogens, but we still have four electrons left. Where are we going to put them? We put them as non-bonding pairs around the oxygen. So this is a Lewis dot structure of water. It has a sigma bond between the central oxygen and each of the hydrogen atoms, plus two non-bonded pairs around the oxygen. Okay, we're having success, so let's go to the next one. In H3, ammonia. Nitrogen will have to go in the middle. Again, hydrogens can never. If we add up VT, we will again get eight. Each of these happen to have eight total valence electrons, each of the three examples on this slide. So we place nitrogen in the center, and we count down the eight electrons. And when we do, we will, two at a time, we'll form sigma bonds between the central nitrogen and each of the hydrogens. But then we'll have two electrons left over. Where do we put them? We can't put them around hydrogen because hydrogen, because you can't put non-bonded pairs or these extra electrons around the hydrogen. Instead, we put the extra electrons around the central nitrogen, and this is the Lewis dot structure for ammonia. 
All right, let's do a couple that are a little more challenging. CH2O, formaldehyde. Who's going to be the central atom? Uh, carbon, okay, because carbon is less electronegative than oxygen, and hydrogen can never be in the middle. So we're first of all thinking of our a skeleton of our molecules having carbon in the middle, oxygen as a terminal atom, and then two hydrogens as terminal atoms. If we add up the total number of valence electrons, four for carbon, six for oxygen, two times one for hydrogen, Vt is 12. So we place the carbon in the middle, and then we count down from 12. And in doing this, we would form a sigma bond between the carbon and oxygen, sigma bonds between the carbon and the two hydrogens, that gets rid of six of these 12, and we still have six electrons left over. What do we do with them? We place them as non-bonded pairs around the oxygen. That was the rule. Place them around the oxygen. And when we do so, you see the structure is shown. Now, we have to now go to the next rule, and that is, is the octet rule satisfied? I didn't mention this rule in the previous ones because, in fact, the octet rule was satisfied. The central atom would be surrounded by eight electrons, and so it wasn't really an issue. But let's look at this case with formaldehyde. The initial Lewis dot structure that we draw has only six electrons, which has three sigma bonded pairs, six electrons around the central atom. So it doesn't satisfy the octet rule. How do we overcome this and help out the central carbon? So it will satisfy the octet rule. We do that by moving down or recruiting a non-bonded pair of electrons from the term from the terminal oxygen to form a second bond, which is called a pi bond between carbon and oxygen. And when we do that, formaldehyde, as shown, will satisfy the octet rule because he now thinks it has eight electrons. The terminal oxygen, by the way, still thinks it is surrounded by eight electrons. But to boot, what we have discovered is that the lewis dot structure of this molecule includes a double bond between a central carbon and a terminal oxygen. Similarly, we can do carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Note that when we draw this out, I'll go ahead and show you the drawings, and you can do these and try these on your own. When you draw the Lewis dot structure for carbon dioxide, you'll discover that it has carbon in the middle, of course, two terminal oxygens, but it has two double bonds between the central carbon and each of the two terminal oxygens, and these terminal oxygens, to boot, have uh, two non-bonded pairs. The octet rule is satisfied for each atom. Each atom thinks it's surrounded by eight electrons. Sulfur dioxide, a little, a little bit different. When we draw it out, we see that we wind up with a Lewis dot structure that has a single sigma bond between the sulfur and one of the terminal oxygens, and a double bond between the central sulfur and the other oxygen. And to boot, there's a non-bonded pair that we place around the central sulfur, as well as some non-bonded pairs around the two terminal oxygens. The key point is that SO2 sulfur dioxide has a different Lewis dot structure than does carbon dioxide, even though you might have otherwise thought that they would have been the same. Now we can handle polyatomic ions in the same way. At the top I show carbonate, and I show the initial Lewis dot structure that you would draw following the rules of adding up VT, putting the least electronegative atom in the center, counting down the 24 valence electrons, uh, placing the extra electrons around the terminal oxygen, and you get to the step where you check for the octet rule. And in this case, as you can see, the central carbon does not satisfy the octet rule. It only has six electrons around it. So what do you do? You recruit or bring down a pair of non bond electrons from one of the terminal oxygens. It doesn't matter which in your mind you recruited from. We'll get to that a little later when we talk about resonance forms. But when you do that, you wind up with this structure for carbonate, in which the central carbon has single bonds to two oxygens and a double bond to the third oxygen. Usually we draw it in a symmetrical way to have the uh, double bond pointing up as shown. It's not essential, but that's usually the way we draw molecules in chemistry. We always go for symmetry. Now, a little later, we'll talk about resonance forms and how the position of the double bond is actually fleeting and exists in all three positions because it sort of moves around. 
Next, let's talk about sulfate, for which the total number of valence electrons is 32. The least electronegative atom is sulfur. You place sulfur in the middle. You dress it around four oxygens. You count down from 32. You place the extra electrons around the terminal oxygen atoms. And when you do that, you would wind up with the initial Lewis dot structure shown in the bottom. And the octet rule is actually satisfied for each of these atoms. The sulfur thinks it's surrounded by eight electrons. The oxygens think that they're surrounded by eight electrons. And we're pretty happy. But later, we're going to discuss another concept called formal charge. And we will see that the top Lewis dot structure that I've drawn here actually is probably the dominant form due to a consideration that we will talk about a little later. And two more problematic cases, boron trifluoride for which VT is 24. Again, if you follow all the steps, boron is much less electronegative than fluorine, so it goes in the middle. Three positions for the three fluorines. You distribute the 24 electrons with the additional electrons going around the terminal fluorines, and you wind up with this Lewis dot structure. You then ask the question about the octet rule, and yes, that boron only has six electrons instead of eight. And so a possibility, again, is to recruit a pair of non-bonded electrons from one of the fluorine atoms to bring down to form a pi bond, a second bond. So the second Lewis dot structure that I draw makes sense following all the rules. However, after we discuss this concept of formal charges, that we'll get to in the next uh, video lecture, you'll see that there, there is this additional consideration that actually leads us to believe that the top Lewis dot structure is the preferred one. So these are some of these sort of problematic cases. I'm showing you the ones for which the Lewis dot structure is not exactly what you would think, just because I want to make sure that you understand the, the, these, these problem cases. And the last concept for this video lecture is the expanded octet, or molecules that have an expanded octet. PF5, phosphorus pentafluoride, is an example. The number of valence electrons is 40. If we follow all the rules, phosphorus in the middle, five fluorines around the central atom, distribute those 40 electrons, place the X ones around the terminal atoms, you would see that we wind up with this. Now the only problem is that the phosphorus that we've drawn has 10 electrons around it instead of 8. Hmm. Well, we will learn that certain molecules, when the central atom is in a particular row or below, you can have more than 8 electrons around the atom. That is, you can expand the octet. The octet rule doesn't have to be followed. You can have 10 or even 12 uh, electrons around the central atom. Uh, so we'll pause at this time and uh, so that we don't go on too long and then we'll continue on these discussions.